Welcome Barista League High Density. I'm Taylor Cowan. I'm the co-founder of Spirit Tea and the director of education. This is a very close look into a cultivar called Chilon and how the decisions made by a producer intimately affect the outcome of that tea. Uh, even the smallest steps can have big implications when it comes to tea production. So without any further ado, let's take a look. The lead producer of this tea is Cindy Chen in cooperation with the Joe family. They've been producing tea since 1998 and presently her plot sits on about three quarters of a hectare. There are less than 200 kilos of Chilon produced each year by the Joes and we're very lucky to be one of the few importers to source it. The plot sits about 600 meters above sea level with gentle south facing slopes in the Wuyishan region, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the most iconic natural locations of China. It's a famous saying in China that Fujian is one part farmland, one part river, eight part mountains. Wuisan is no exception. It's a region known for its clear water and biodiversity of plants. In terms of soil composition, we see a lot of glutenite and famously ferruginous, iron rich soils. A lot of volcanic topsoils, which are great for tea growing. And the acidic soil is also uh, produces a distinct taste that I think you don't find anywhere else in the world. Wuyisan is notoriously foggy, about 120 days of fog a year, and strange as it may seem to say for northern Fujian, it is a maritime climate. In 2020, Wuyisan was designated as a Chinese national park, which is a significant development in that it preserves the superb ecology of the region. But there are now restrictions on new tea farms being planted. This means both to newcomers and existing holders. This just happened, so it'll be interesting to see how the situation develops. Now, Yancha. Yancha simply means rock tea. These teas spring from the very fairest soil, so iron rich it is red in color. Uh, a density of iron causes tea to produce a flavonoid in return called camphorol. Camphorol binds up iron and compartmentalizes it so it doesn't damage the tea plant. When you drink camphorol, it triggers the trigeminal nerve in your throat that is akin to the feeling of cold, giving a cool, clean impression, which may be the scientific basis of the poetic tasting sensation called Yan Yun. Now, Yan Yun is most commonly and inaccurately referred to as rock taste. It is difficult to describe the sensation it refers to, but Yun is an interesting one because it doesn't so much literally mean taste, but it's sometimes translated as rhyme. It's idiogrammatically related to artistic beauty, music. Yun has a haunting, ethereal quality. I asked Cindy her take on Yan Yun, and she said, it's a kind of feeling. It's like when you finish brushing your teeth. And as unusual as that description may be, I can't wait for you to try it yourself. Cindy's tea we're trying today is called Chilan. Chilan translates most simply to rare orchid. It is the name of the cultivar of tea. It's important to remember that all tea comes from the same plant, a common species. Camellia is the genus, Sinensis is the species. Below Sinensis on the taxonomic level, the next classification is variety. And these can be naturally occurring or it could be a cultivated version, a cultivated variety. This is what Chilon is, a beloved cultivated variety which finds itself most belovedly as a charcoal roasted yancha. That said, producers these days are experimenting with its context, so while it may traditionally be oolong, now we're seeing it as black tea and there are even white tea Chilons. What's really important to understand about tea process as it relates to this talk is that to put hard delineations on tea categories like white, green, black is convenient and aids our understanding and classification of tea. It's especially useful to a beginner who's building a framework of tea knowledge. But the more we learn, the more this way of thinking threatens to downplay and oversimplify the essential miracle of tea, that there is no such thing as white tea or green tea, only tea. It's a truth that makes it at least as compelling a botanic experience as wine or coffee. Every flavor, sense, experience we've encountered, thousands of possibilities originate from the self-same plant species. So my hope today is that you'll leave talking about green tea, white tea, black tea, not as firm bordered categorical styles, or worse, the summation of their oxidation level, none of that, but to tear down those delineations. And if we must use colors, call it a green tea process. In a sense, it's no different then the difference between a washed or a natural process on the self-same coffee. Whatever base material you are working with in tea can in theory become any style of tea. What we're tasting today is the same raw material, inexorably linked by its biology and sense of place, a three quarter hectare garden. We're gonna try it as the raw material itself, a charcoal roasted version, and oxidized to a Hongcha black tea version. 
The three expressions of this chi lawn we're trying today were harvested this year in Wusan. Next, I want to talk about some of the decisions in processing that led to these three expressions. The first version of Cindy Chen's chi lawn we're going to look at is called mao cha. It's sometimes translated as raw tea. This is basically tea that's awaiting its final steps and refinement from market. And so to begin with, four leaves on a stem are picked from the bush. The first step they're going to undergo once they reach the Zhou's factory is withering. A tea shoot begins wilting the moment it's separated from the bush that's nourishing it. And withering is basically the controlled dehydration and concentration of aromatic compounds. It's really one of the most important steps in tea production because the volatiles begin to intermingle and create the tea's primary aroma complex. A producer will use their best instincts to determine when a tea is sufficiently withered. Uh, next, the tea is fixed. This means exposing the withered leaves to such significant heat, cooking it in a sense that it fixes or ceases the plant's enzymatic oxidation activity. It freezes the plant chemistry in time, so to speak, and discourages any further oxidation. These fixed leaves are then rolled. The machine roller mixes leaf enzymes with the chemicals they act on, producing flavor. It also concentrates flavor compounds by reducing moisture. The roller will selectively bruise and reduce exposed surface area of the leaf, uh, helping to encourage multiple unraveling steepings and preserving freshness. Finally, the leaves will be dried, the total moisture content brought to a point where it's shelf stable. Now, if you took this malcha and removed any stems, dust or huangbian, yellow leaf, any undesirable material, you would then commit it to charcoal roasting. Cement pits in a dedicated room are filled with warm lychee charcoals, which produce negligible smoke and don't impart too heavy of a charcoal flavor. It can take hours, but the charcoals in these pits are allowed to burn until they reach white hot temperatures. And contrary to how you might imagine the roasting takes place with flames licking up onto leaves like vegetables on a grill, the charcoals are actually already burnt down to gray ashes by the time that the bamboo basket carrying the tea is placed over them. The leaves are roasted at such explicit temperatures that caffeine literally evaporates from them. Charcoal roasted teas are a little lower in caffeine for this reason. Now, let's take a look at Hong Cha. The uniformity of its shape is just amazing. And unlike the Mao Cha and unlike the charcoal roasted processes, there is no explicit fixing or cooking here. Um, to get this much oxidation from leaves, you have to push it along. And in this case, oxidation is induced by the heavy bruising of machine roller. After a few tossing of the bruised leaves until the desired oxidation level is reached, the black tea is dried to shelf stabilize and enhance aroma. Just as with coffee, it's important when you're comparing teas to have uniform specifications for infusion. You'll want a constant amid all the variables. For each of the lots, we're gonna try five grams of tea, 340 grams of water, 95 to 100 degrees Celsius water, or as high as you can get it, and three minutes of infusion time. So let me walk you through each step. First, you'll want to pre-warm your teapot with a bit of hot water. Discard this water. Dose your five grams of tea into the teapot. Then this is a great opportunity to take in the aromas awakened in the dry tea by the warmth and moisture of the teapot. It enlivens some of the more delicate aromas you won't necessarily detect in a bag of dry leaves. Take a moment, slowly inhale. Really see what the tea is giving you before filling with hot water. Go ahead and fill the pot with 350 grams of 95 Celsius water. You can begin your three minute timer as soon as there is contact between the leaves and the water. Once those three minutes have elapsed, you'll want to decant into your empty, warmed serving pitcher. And then in turn, you can decant into whatever pre-warmed vessel you're going to drink from. Let it cool a bit, then sip and savor. This is the process you'll want to repeat for each of these teas. What do you taste with the Mao Cha? For one, I think that most fans of Yan Cha would say that this is going to be the most tannic and unrefined iteration of the tea. 
Uh, but there are some redeeming characteristics, and I always like looking in unpopular and often maligned teas, or something that's seen as unfinished in this case, finding something you like. And with this one, uh, it has in the unmistakable, what I call Fujin Sour. Um, in this province, including oolongs that are completely unrelated to Yansha, uh, you find this awesome, compelling, sour kind of bitter green taste. And, I, and it's separate from tannin, it's separate from astringency. Look for that. Um, I also think that there's an underlying, very, very mild uh, honeydew melon flavor to it. Um, there's some florals there. Um, I think we get so jaded with honey sometimes as tea tasters that we don't realize it's there, but there is definitely a honey note. And also look for the, um, just the, in the floral note, it's, it's almost like a white flower. With the malcha as a baseline reference, how do you notice that the charcoal roasted chilam is a little bit different? For one, the caramelization is unmistakable. I think that what the intense sustained heat environment of charcoal roasting does to the tea is produce that sweetness in turn. Um, I think that there are a lot of parallels to sort of brown uh, spirits in terms of it, it, it's a little bit brandy like it's a little bit bourbon like in the balance of maltiness and sweetness. There is an acorn squashiness to it, a savory, sort of wonderful summery, uh, summer squash kind of taste or pumpkin, if you will. And also, I think that that yan yun, uh, as we talked about the rock taste, rock rhyme, rock beauty of the tea is extremely pronounced, uh, both in the taste, but especially uh, and the elements about drinking this tea that are not the taste, including the ethereal and vaporous um, after feeling of drinking it. This is exactly what Yan Yun is talking about. Um, it's almost like the space uh, that indicates its existence by something that is missing. And the it's hot, not easily describable in terms of a recognizable note or flavor um, from our realm of existence. But uh, I encourage you to hone in on it. Sip again and sip again and, and pause and really look for Yan Yun. Finally, tasting the Qilan black tea process, the most contemporary iteration of Qilan. What's the difference you notice in flavor between charcoal roasting and the oxidized expression? Too often, the two are conflated when folks are talking about wulong that is dark in appearance. But it's really important to hone in on the outlier step here. If 90% of the steps of a tea's production are the same as with, say, the malcha and the charcoal roasted process, how much of a difference does that charcoal roasting process make between the two? And the answer is almost all of the difference. Even the smallest step can make uh, an inexorably large effect on the tea. So how do you think the oxidation of the black tea affects the mouthfeel of this Jilan? Um, I think that here we find the most explicit honey taste, the biggest body and the most uniform appearance. There's very plush tannin in the mouthfeel. There's notes of rose, tropical fruit. I say almost like a peach ring kind of taste. This is a bizarre unifying characteristic it shares with other Fujian traditional oolong cultivars that are processed as black tea. And to me, there's even a baked squash quality to it. All in all, it's a beautiful example of a black tea and I hope you like it. Regardless of the fact that it is quite unconventional, it's delicate, it's clean, there's a little astringency, but for the most part, really balanced, uh, while still being recognizably chi lan. Thanks for coming along with us on One Tea, Three Expressions. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and whether you've been tasting or just following along, and I hope that you'll continue your quest into tea. Uh, part of why direct relationships are so important is that it's not only ethical, but it allows you to expand your knowledge in a way that um, obfuscatory and uh, concealing sourcing practices don't. Um, 
it's both enlightening and I hope inspires your curiosity to continue your journey to tea. It can be a big world. There's 6,000 years of history, thousands of known iterations of tea, and there's more every single day. So thank you for being here. I'm Taylor Cowan. Good evening.